Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Diane Lapis. I am the, the trustee of the Beacon Historical Society. I keep thinking I'm still the president, but I'm not. <laughs> um, so welcome to this evening's program. Before we begin, we'd like to say the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag is over here. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. No, it's not, um, it's not magnifying the sound. It's actually going directly to the videographer. So I will be speaking loudly. I hope you can hear me. OK, thank you. So um, before we begin, I want to just mention some of the upcoming events that we have at the Historical Society. We currently have a wonderful exhibit called Great Estates, where we're featuring 13 different um, homes and the people that live there. So please come join us on Thursdays from 10 to 12 and Saturdays from 1 to 3 to see this really wonderful exhibit. I'd like to thank Diane Murphy for curating it. Thank you, Diane. It's really great. Um, and regarding the great estates, uh, Denise Van Buren, our president, will be giving two presentations about uh, the great estates. The first one will be June 6th at Two Way Brewing in Beacon. And also we will meet, re meet here on June 27th for our regular monthly meeting at 7 p.m. And June 10th, also in this building, we are having our annual postcard show and sale. We're having about 12 to 14 vendors where you can purchase postcards, books, and ephemera. Please come support that event. It's a fundraiser for us. Uh, tickets are $4. We're selling raffles. Um, my husband's making hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's a lot of fun. And if you collect postcards, or if you have postcards that you want to sell, you can bring them to, um, to ask any of the dealers if they, want it, if they want to buy them from you. Or you can donate them to us, and we resell them as a benefit to our organization. And that's how we have four wonderful boxes currently from donations from people like you. OK, so uh, some of you may know that in 2016, the city of Beacon held a dedication ceremony to install a Margaret Fuller marker at the Beacon Visitor Center at Pole Hill Park. Our guest today will tell us about Margaret Fuller's legacy as a poet, a visionary, a scholar, and a writer, and a social activist. In the fall of 1884, Fuller was the guest at the Van Vliet House in Fishkill Landing, which is now Beacon, where she wrote the seminal feminist book entitled Woman in the 19th Century. So our speaker this evening, Angela Reich, lives on Long Island's South Shore, where she serves as a docent for New York's historical Fire Island Lighthouse. <laughs> and sales as a crew member for the Long Island Maritime Museum's 1888 historic oyster sloop named Priscilla. Angela who holds a PhD in literature and is an independent researcher. She shares her knowledge of Long Island's hi maritime history, giving lectures for Fire Island Lighthouse and for various historical societies. Angela has published articles on literary criticism in professional journals, and a book on John Milton's Paradise Regained. Her first novel, Ship, Ship, Shipwreck of Hopes, draws inventively on the life of Margaret Fuller and her harrowing journeys. Without further delay, please welcome Angela to our program. Thank you, Diane, and thank you for your hospitality and for inviting us down, and thank you to Peter for all of your introduction to this beautiful area. Um, and thank you guys for coming. I was a little bit worried about um, the attendance tonight because it is the finals of Jeopardy! Masters, <laughs> and I was afraid I'd be alone here, but thank you guys for coming. So who knew we planned this so long ago that it was going to be Jeopardy's master. So also tonight, today, is Margaret Fuller's birthday. She would be 213 years old today, so we all feel very young and frisky. But um, before I start the actual program in memory of Margaret Fuller, I want to read to you this really, I think, wonderful um, 
uh, explanation of her personality written by a friend of hers, uh, Sarah Clark. So this is, I want you to have this image of her in your mind. In looking for the causes of the great influence possessed by Margaret Fuller over her pupils, companions, and friends, I find something in the fact of her unusual truth-speaking power. She not only did not speak lies after our foolish social customs, but she met you fairly. She broke her lance upon your shield. Encountering her glance, something like an electric shock was felt. Her eye pierced through your disguises. Your outer works fell before her first assault, and you were at her mercy. <laughs> So in short, not to offend anybody, she was a badass. But she invented the word. She was so cool. So, um, talk louder? Oh, can you guys hear me? Not in the back, okay. So um, this talk is gonna center on the making of Shipwreck of Hopes uh, and the inspiration for the novel. It's a historical fiction. And it's the life and times of Margaret Fuller. So if you read Shipwreck of Hopes, the reader is swept from Fuller's life in Massachusetts, then in New York, then across the Atlantic Ocean to war-torn Europe, and then back again on her tragic return voyage to America. So there's a lot to the story, so strap yourselves in. I'm gonna have you everywhere, all over the map. And I wanna talk about my major research areas the life of Margaret Fuller, and then I have to talk a little bit about the history of the life-saving service at the time so that you can understand the circumstances that she faced when her ship hit the shore. So we're going to talk a little bit of maritime history. And then finally, I want to talk about what actually happened on the shores of Long Island on the day of the wreck. So I'm going to start at the end, the setting of the scene of the wreck, of the Elizabeth, which is the shoreline and the condition of the life-saving service. Okay, so here's uh, the south shore of Long Island. The red line indicates the shipping lanes if you were coming directly in from Europe. Here are the barrier islands along the south shore, and this little red dot there is the location of the Fire Island Lighthouse. So you could see how important the uh, lighthouse was to all those ships that were coming in from Europe. So that in the early 1800s, if you left Europe under sail before the age of steam, two months later, the first man-made light you would see was the Fire Island Lighthouse. That's how important that flash of light was to those incoming ships heralding them into New York Harbor. <clears throat> so um, the two, the most important things that I'm trying to point out here is the geography of the sailing ships coming in from Europe and the location of the lighthouse. But New York Harbor was growing like crazy and there was another reason besides the geography and that reason is the Erie Canal. So they opened the Erie Canal in the early 1800s. So now that little harbor town of New York was growing like crazy because now there was all this international shipping opportunity from all the great stuff coming in from the Midwest through the Erie Canal down the Hudson River. So at that point, the early 1800s, New York Harbor was doing more than 60% of all the harbor trade in this country, right? So it was a hot place to be. And so therefore, they recognized the, that we needed to have uh, more protection for the shipping lanes. Go ahead. So this is a map which is the shipwrecks of Wreck Valley. So the south shore of Long Island and the coast of New Jersey was called Wreck Valley because there were so many wrecks of all those ships that were coming in. So our coastlines, we love our coastlines. They're beautiful, they're sandy, they're gorgeous, but they're very treacherous because of sandbars. 
So you can't map a sandbar, especially back then, because they move around with every storm. So every storm that came in, the captains had no notion of where they should be in the shipping lanes uh, if they got blown off the shipping lanes. So they, the uh, United States government started to build some lighthouses and they started to invest in a shore-based life-saving system. So the 1826 Fire Island Lighthouse was built and this is not the picture of the brochure I'm giving out because this lighthouse was very small, half the height of the current lighthouse, and it was the state of the art at the time it was built. The next thing they started to do was address the, sh the uh, maritime safety addressed by the Life Saving Benevolent Association. So what they did was they invested in 10 original life saving huts in 1848. So you can see it looks like a little one car garage. Now, the shore of Long Island is 120 miles long. How many life saving huts are there? So, how far apart were these life saving huts? All right, so that's one thing. And then the next thing is they were equipped with whatever equipment they had, but they were not manned. They didn't have enough money to have crews on board. So now you have life saving huts that are like 10 miles apart on these deserted barrier islands. And so your ship comes in and crashes into the shore. First of all, it's a deserted island, so somebody has to notice. And then secondly, somebody has to go around and get volunteers to show up at the hut and take the equipment down to the wreck site. I want you to understand this because Margaret Fuller was on board a ship that hit our shore. This was the life-saving service at the time. So let's take a look at some of the equipment and stuff, so it's pretty cool. So this was what was inside the hut. There was a, a cart on which the equipment was placed. The equipment was a little cannon called a Lyle gun, and they would shoot that cannon out to the ailing ship with a hawser, which is a heavy rope, and if they were the survivors would attach the rope to the mast, and they would attach a breeches buoy, which is a buoy with a pair of breeches sewn into it, a pair of pants so that you didn't fall out the bottom. And they would set it up with a block and tackle on the hawser so that you would climb the mast, get into the breeches buoy, and then they would haul you in like we hauled in our laundry in back in the 60s. <laughs> right? One at a time, if you were lucky. Because normally, these storms happen in the winter, and it was crazy windy. Sometimes the uh, uh, Lyle gun couldn't even get the line out because of the wind. What else there was were the lighthouses and a lifeboat which weighed 1,000 pounds. So let's go to the next slide. Here's uh, the, <laughs> the lucky mariner who's being rescued in the breeches buoy, and there's your survivors, and there's the next guy sitting up here waiting for his turn to come in and out again, if it were your lucky day. Next slide. Here's the uh, beach cart with all that stuff in there being hauled down the beach in a storm. So I don't know if you guys are beachgoers, but I get tired bringing my beach chair from the parking lot down, and these guys are in a storm hauling, th there's tons of equipment down there. Okay, next slide. Here's the lifeboat being taken out during a storm. N look at the uh, life preservers. They were a bunch of corks sewn together. That was high tech. It was what they had, right? So next. And then here's a, the picture of uh, somebody who's uh, very uh, hopeful. <laughs> and they're climbing the rigging, and he's swinging from this thing, thinking he's going to get himself into that boat. And this was uh, if it worked, if this is if the system worked, this is what you had. Okay, where are we now? Okay, back to my, my map. I love this map. It's in the lighthouse. It's made by Edward Lee Spence, and he was a very famous underwater archaeologist. Um, and he researched the names of the wrecks. So every one of these words or phrases here is the name of a wreck in Wreck Valley. Now this map is from the 70s, 1970s, so now 
there's, they realize there's four to 7,000 wrecks because they have the equipment where you can radiate down under the sand. There's way more than uh, Edward Lee Spence was able to find back in the 1970s. So you might be asking yourself, okay, so here she is studying all these shipwrecks from the Fire Island Lighthouse. Why this wreck out of all these wrecks? And the reason is simple. It's because of Margaret Fuller. So I'm a retired English teacher. I take on this uh, wonderful lighthouse to become a docent, and I'm reading and studying and reading and studying, and then all of a sudden I come across the wreck of the Elizabeth, and I'm like, what? Margaret Fuller was here on my beach at my lighthouse? Like, I just couldn't put, imagine putting all those pieces together. So I had to start researching who she was and what she was about. Of course, I came across her in my studies, in my graduate studies, but I never studied her per se. So I had been in awe of her because although women in her day were not allowed a higher education, she was the first female to be allowed to use the Harvard Library. She shared her education on history, philosophy, the study of classical civilizations through her writings and seminars. And she published treatises on abolition, prison conditions, conditions in mental hospitals, women's suffrage. In short, she became the voice for those who had no voice. So I'm sure you're wondering, if women weren't allowed higher education, how did she get so smart? Well, it was because of her father, Timothy Fuller, who was a Harvard graduate, and look at his life of service. Massachusetts state senator, served in the US Congress, state counselor, state house of representatives, he had a life of service. And look at those years. He was in some of the earliest Congresses of this country, where they're trying to figure out, what is this country about? What are our laws going to be? How are we going to form this new society in this new country? So here's Margaret, this young girl who's listening to this. This was her dinner table conversation. Just imagine uh, the atmosphere that she grew up in. The father just realized how brilliant she was. So from the age of four and a half, he started tutoring his Harvard education right into her little brain. And he was the son of a Puritan minister, so there was no patty cake going on. She was, she was given very difficult and very stringent uh, instruction from the time she was a child. So this is both a privilege and a challenge for her because girls her age didn't have this education. So there she is reading Dante's Inferno and Virgil's Aeneid and in the native languages she's reading in Italian and Latin and all these little girls want to play dolls and house, and here she is, you know, with all this classical education. So she was very lonely when she was young. She didn't have a lot of friends, so it had its privileges, but it also had its challenge for her. So she was able to address all these questions of change and politics because she had the background in philosophy and history, and she was able to measure what it is we're trying to decide against what had been decided before. So she was really an anomaly. She had no female peers. She ended up becoming part of that um, Cambridge Brain Trust. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau. And so uh, the transcendentalist movement and all of those free thinking uh, people who really shaped what America still thinks today. They were uh, very influential. So she became the editor of the first literary journal in America called The Dial. Now, at that time, America was still looking across the ocean in order to find culture, the arts, literature, music, every, all culture was coming from across the ocean. So she and Thoreau and Emerson said, wait a minute, we have our own brand new country here, so we need to form an American Arts and Letters. So this was the vehicle to begin forming American 
arts and American letters, American literature. So she was the editor of this magazine with that specific aid, aim. So that brought her a lot of notoriety. Then, in 1845, she published Woman in the 19th Century, which was her groundbreaker. In that book, she considered the roles and responsibilities of women and men in this newly forming country of ours. It was a huge hit. It sold out the first printing right away. She made more printings. So where was this book written in 1844? Right here in what was Fishkill Landing. So let's go to the next slide. So thank you to the Beacon Historical Society where she, she stayed here for seven weeks in order to be able to rest and write. So this is Lower Main Street in Fishkill Landing where Margaret Fuller stayed in October of 1844 and where she began writing Woman in the 19th Century. Do you recognize this? <laughs> All those buildings are down, right? But you could see it was on the river. Sorry? Yeah. So I found this historical sketch, if you go, of uh, the town of Fishkill. It was printed in 1866, which is after the time period we're talking about, but it talked about the history of, and it says, in 1714, Dutchess County contained a population of 445 with 67 heads of families. They richly deserve a place for they were the pioneers of this section of the country and throughout the adjacent settlements. So there's a list of names here of some of the original people who lived here and on that list was the name Garrett Van Vliet. Let's go to the next slide. So we're interested in him because his, um, and his, uh, his uh, blah, blah, Descendant is Stuart Van Vliet, and that's whose house she stayed in while she was here. So he was born in Vermont and raised in Fishkill Landing. You can see he had a military background. So he's important to us because, can you go to the next slide? This is the Van Vliet house, and this photo is a courtesy of Mr. David Turner. Thank you so much. Look at this house, it's beautiful. And it was right on the river. I'm sorry, I'm in your way, right? And then here is, thank you Beacon Historical again, is a map with a big arrow about where this location is. So you might recognize where that is, right? Uh oh. So she came here to rest and write to be able to complete her book, Woman in the 19th Century. Uh, she was a nature lover. She loved to walk and she loved being outside. And I, f I was looking for whatever she wrote while she was here besides the book. She wrote a lot of letters and she wrote in her journals. So I'm going to just quote to you some of the things she said about being here. So she wrote to her brother Richard Fuller on October 15th of 1844. And she says to him, can I find words to tell you how I enjoy being here, encircled by the majestic beauty of these mountains? I am glad to feel enfranchised in the society of nature. I have a well-ordered, quiet house to dwell in. From my windows, I see over the tops of variegated trees, the river with its purple heights beyond. And a few moments walk brings me to the lovely shore. If I go back in the country, there are mountain paths and lonely glens and rushing streams with many voiced waterfalls. So just leave it there, because you went ahead. Yeah, okay. So in addition, in addition to that, I have other quotes for letters describing the beauty of Fishkill Landing. From the brain of the purple mountain flows forth cheer to my somewhat weary mind. I feel refreshed amid these bolder shapes of nature. And in another letter she says, the boldness, sweetness, and variety here are just what I like. 
I could pass the autumn in watching the exquisite changes of light and shade on the heights across the river. And finally, a few moments walk brings me to the lovely shore where sails are gliding continually by, and over all are spread the gorgeous hues of autumn. So in addition to these quotes that are from uh, there, I wanted to find something in her handwriting so you could see authentically what her handwriting was. So this is a letter, and this is from Boston Public Library to uh, William Channing, November 5th of 1844, and it was a poem that she sent to him. So she's writing poetry, she's writing her book, she's writing letters, she's writing her journals, she's taking walks in the woods. And also while she was here in Fishkill Landing, she pursued another one of her, favor her, her major concerns, which was the reform of prison conditions. Remember I gave you a list of some of her major ideas, and this was one of the ones that she uh, paid attention to while she was here. So which was a visit to Sing Sing Prison. So she had managed to get a friend of hers, Georgiana Bruce, a position in the women's um, prison at Sing Sing because there was a uh, very forward-thinking uh, new director there who was interested in a more humane approach to the incarcerated. She wrote uh, on October 20th of 1844, she said, on Saturday we went up to Sing Sing in a little way boat. After 12 at noon, I was allowed to have some of the women out to talk with, and the interview was very pleasant. I told them I was writing about women, and I told them that my path had been a favored one. I wanted to gain more information from those who had been tempted and afflicted. So while she's writing women in the 19th century, she's reaching out to women other than people who had the same background as she did. So there were f several letters about Sing Sing and some follow-up uh, besides that one visit that she had been there for. So, go ahead. While she was here, she enjoyed nature and walking and writing until finally this letter on, in November of 1844, she wrote to her friend, again, William Channing, that she finished Woman in the 19th Century. She says, Quote, after taking a long walk, early one exhilarating morning I sat down to work and did not give it the last stroke till near nine in the evening. Then I felt a delightful glow as if I had put a good deal of my true life in it and as if, should I go away now, the measure of my footprint would be left on the earth. Right, so remember her father and the universal gigantic vision that was had in her family and she had that same type of vision. She had the privilege of this education but she didn't want to keep it to herself. She wanted to make sure that she was doing something to press our society forward in her thinking. So, let's, go ahead. Let's talk about woman in the 19th century. What was going on with that? What did she write? So, there's a lot of quotes from this book. I'm not gonna take too many of them, but a couple that I think are pertinent. This is one that has, speaks to women in her time period, but also to her personally. She says, consider that she does not hold property on equal terms with men, so that if a husband dies without making a will, the wife, instead of taking at once his place as head of the family, inherits only a part of his fortune as if she were a child or ward only, not an equal partner. So, this rings a bell to me because I was reading her letters and I remembered a letter that she wrote um, back way earlier than that to her mother because that brilliant father of hers, remember Timothy Fuller? Guess what, he died without a will. <laughs> you know, it's like the plumber who has a clogged sink at home, right? He goes around fixing everything except his own house. So anyway, poor Margaret Crane Fuller, Margaret's mom, um, 
had, they, there were six children in the family. Margaret was the oldest. And Uncle Abraham did not think that women should get an education. Uh, she had two younger children in the family, Lloyd, who had some emotional problems, and Uncle Abraham didn't think it was worth educating him, nor the youngest sister. So here's Margaret, who's teaching and writing, and now she's putting forth to take care of this family because Uncle Abraham is holding on to the money because he doesn't like the idea of spending it on frivolous things like that. So here she is, to my very dear mother. This was written in September of 1837. So Margaret's born in 1810, so she's young, right? Do not suffer the remarks of that sordid man to give you any uneasiness. Proceed to act as we agreed when I was with you. It is perfectly clear to my mind that the arrangements me made then are the right ones, and I do not fear to hold myself responsible for the consequences. You must, my dear mother, steadily consider yourself as the guardian of the children. You must not let his vulgar insults make you waver as to giving the children advantages to which they would be well entitled. No judge in the world will ever interfere with your management of the minor children. And then she goes on saying to fit out the children for school, and if he doesn't come forth with the money, I'll work extra, I'll pay for it. So Margaret Fuller, when she writes Woman in the 19th Century, is not just writing in theory. You know, she's writing about the real circumstances that women were dealing with at the time. So, what else does she say? No, leave it on there, please. I'm having trouble, because I didn't know I had to handle a microphone, and it's like, oh, all these papers. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Just throw them all around. So, she also talks about, a little bit somewhere else in the book, how hard it was to stand up and make these demands at that time, because it was radical. I mean, people don't like everything being upset and turned upside down, and this was really gonna turn everything upside down if you educate women and give them a right to hold property and give them the right to vote and all that. It was gonna make a mess, and people don't like the mess. So, she says, it demands some valor to lift one's head amidst the shower of public anger, scorn, and derision, called out by the, man, the demand that women shall be put on a par with their brethren, that they should hold property not by permission, but by right. And as I started out, she was a badass, and she was standing up for what she thought, no matter who said what about her. Last quote I'm gonna take from that book. We would have every arbitrary barrier thrown down. We would have every path laid open to women as freely as to man. When freedom for women as much as for man shall be acknowledged as a right, not yielded as a concession. Right? Okay. All right, Margaret. I love this woman. Yeah. Oh, it's somebody. Oh, okay. There, there you go. That's okay. So, we can go to the next slide. So the no notoriety that she was receiving from the dial and from women in the 19th century caught the attention of a lot of people, including this guy, Horace Greeley, who was also a liberal-minded guy, and he was starting his brand new publication, the New York Tribune, in New York City. So. He wanted her to come to New York and become his literary editor. So by this time, um, the kids were grown, things were well at home, and she took this opportunity to go ahead and move to New York City. And so she lived with uh, the Greeleys for a short time. They had a place, <laughs> you know what, it was near, uh, it was called Turtle Bay, it's near where the UN is now, and it was a farm. It was a, the country, right? So she went down there, and it didn't last too long living with them because it was far away from the Tribune office, which was all the way downtown, near where the Brooklyn Bridge is now, and it, it was just inconvenient. So I found this cool picture of the old Tribune office. Isn't that awesome? So uh, none, this is all gone now, because I went down to try to find the address, and all these buildings are gone. Pace University is here now, but isn't that such a cool picture? 
just love this stuff. So anyway, so she ended up leaving the Greeleys and going down there and finding rooms for herself and living on her own. So, I mean, I'm saying that in a sentence, right? But back, it was 1844, women, single women, didn't go live in the city by themselves. It was frowned upon, right? So, I mean, we're, I see the age, we're all about the same age, remember that girl? Yeah. Marlo Thomas, where she's in the city and she's throwing a hat up in the air. Well, there was no hat thrown in those days for women who were on their own. So she was bold and she went and did it because it was the thing for her to do, to be able to do her job in the best way that she can. So there she is. She's in New York. All new people, all new friends, all new surroundings. She made friends with uh, the Springs and they were also liberal-minded people, and they invited her to go to Europe. So let me backtrack, because I forgot to say this before. When Uncle Abraham was holding on to the money, and she had to support the family, she at the time was started her book on Goethe. She was a very big fan, a fan of the German philosopher. So she was writing her book on Goethe, and she was planning on going to Europe to complete the research, but she couldn't because of the whole family situation. So when Rebecca and Marcus Spring invited her to go to Europe, now she was able to go. So off she goes to Europe in 1848. Isn't that great? Yeah. So what's going on in Europe in 1848? Everything, right. So here we go. The European rebellions, and you guys remember your history. So all of these people were looking across the ocean at us now and saying, wait a minute, how come those people get to elect a president? And how come those people get to have representation in Congress? Well, we're under the thumb of the same royal families that have been keeping us down for centuries. So the European rebellions, right? Everywhere, Austria, France, everything was going on. And here comes Margaret Fuller right in the middle of it. I mean, she was incredible, right? She was, knew how to find a story. So <laughs> anyway. This was the beginning, this, this great age of the change in social consciousness, and that was right up her alley, because remember, of her, her background, right? So she traveled to England, to France, and then to Italy, and when she got to Italy, she got involved in the Italian Revolution of 1848. I know, right? <laughs> That's what I mean. I found this, I'm a docent at the lighthouse, I'm finding this story, and it just goes on and on and on. It took me five years to research and write this book because I had to dig out every little piece of it. It was so amazing and interesting. So at the time, Italy was in Italy. At the time, it was a, a different properties that were owned by different countries in Europe. So the Rome, the Papal States right across, was always in the charge of the Pope. Everything north of Rome was the Austrian Empire. The island of Sardinia was France. Everything south of Rome and Sicily was owned by Spain. And so the Italians now, in the midst of all these other revolutions, said, we got to get these people out of here. We want Italy to be for Italians. So here comes Margaret Fuller. And she's taken with this Italian cause for independence. Because it's not that long ago that we booted out King George, right? And that dinner table conversation was the same ideals as to have our country represented by us. Now, I'm going to show you these pictures here. These were pictures of the actual battles in the streets of Rome. They were cannonading and uh, destroying these monuments. Uh, my husband and I went to um, Ferrara, where there's a museum of the Risorgimento, and I found this was one of the original flyers that they posted announcing, Viva la Repubblica! And here's the triumvirate that was elected. So <clears throat> there she lands in the middle of this. She feels the heart of it. She's still working for Horace Greeley. So she is writing. She's witnessing the battles. She's writing about the battles. She's sending her missives back overseas. He's publishing them in the New York Tribune. Essentially, she was the first female war correspondent under war conditions. <laughs> so she's pleading for America to recognize this new democracy. She's trying to make the case. 
while she's there, she also gets involved with another revolutionary, this guy, Giovanni Asoli. So who's Giovanni Asoli? Well, together, they got together and they embarked on supporting the Italian cause for independence. So let's take a look at the pictures. Here's Asoli. He was a noble and he served in the Civic Guard and he was fighting in the battles. This is a picture I got from that museum. Um, fighting in the battles. Meanwhile, Margaret was writing her history of the Italian Revolution and she's writing for Horace Greeley and she served as the director of this hospital in the Tiber in Rome to help the war wounded. She was a busy girl. Oh, and by the way, she was pregnant at the time. Right. Uh-huh, yep. When the moon hits the sky like a big pizza. <laughs> what are you gonna do? So anyway, the Republic originally was um, supported by Pope Leo IX. And then he realized, oh, wait a minute, if these guys win, I'm going to lose power. Because he wasn't just an ecclesiastical, he was also political, right? So he ended up fleeing. And when he fled, he asked all the Catholic uh, countries of Europe to go and defeat these bad revolutionaries. So here um, they had the armies of France and Austria and everything. So it was a very difficult battle. They held out for a year and a half. And then finally, the French came and took over. Uh, they, uh, Mazzini stopped the resistance on June 30th of 1849. And so they occupied Rome. So Fuller in the Italian Revolution, busy girl, war correspondent, director of this hospital, writing the history of the Italian Revolution. And they stayed until the final bellows of the revolution and the French occupation. They were given 24 hours to flee. Now, when Margaret had the baby, she didn't have him in Rome because it was a bloody war uh, site. She went to Rieti, which is 50 miles north, still in the Papal States, and that's where she had the baby and left the baby there, came back to Rome to continue her work. So once they get to 24 hours to flee the Papal States, they beat it to Rieti to get the baby, Angelino. But they couldn't just leave because he was very ill. So they had to stay there and nurse him back to health. And that was very dangerous because you don't want to be the loser of a revolution when there's retributions going on, right? So it was a very dangerous, tough time. And finally, they were able to move him. And then they fled to Florence because Florence was outside the Papal States. And that's where she, uh, they stayed until they were able to get passage home. So I want to show you how much regard they have for Margaret Fuller's contribution in Italy. So these are modern pictures. This is um, an address where she lived, 519 Via del Corso in Rome. And there's a plaque there. And there's another plaque that is dedicated to her also in Rome. I'm going to read the translations. So the top one says, writer, journalist, and supporter of the Mazzinian ideals of liberty and the unification of Italy. And the second one is near the Tiber, where that hospital was, and it says, American journalist commissioned by the Roman Republic to assist the wounded. Yeah. So in the next picture, this is, obviously it's a modern picture because there's a car in it, but this is the plaque on the, on the place where she went to have the baby. So I'm gonna read the plaque. Here she gave birth to their son, Angelo Eugene Philip Ossoli. We honor and remember her commitment as first woman of culture and American war correspondent in combat conditions, in charge of assistance to the wounded of both sides during the Roman Republic in 1849. Together with her husband, Giovanni Ossoli, patriot and National Guard officer, they shared the dream of freedom and unity for Italy of Mazzini and Garibaldi. So, let's go to the next picture, thank you. So as a writer and a researcher now, I have this huge story because I have the development of the life-saving system 
and then I have Margaret Fuller's life in America, then her life in Rome, and then the Italian Revolution. So here comes the last chapter of the research, which is what exactly happened to the Elizabeth on its approach to New York Harbor. All right. So they couldn't afford a steamer. Um, the money from Greeley to Wright wasn't coming in. I mean, there's a war going on and all that. And uh, Ossoli was a noble, but he had a lot of family problems. His father was not happy that he's mixed up with a Protestant Americana, okay? <laughs> then he died, and all the money was left to the older brother, who was on the Pope's Privy Council and his other brothers served in the no guard, guardian noble of the pope. So they're all, right, so here's the black sheep of the family. So he wasn't getting any of the good stuff, right? So they had no money, they lived as best they could in Florence, and they found an, a, a cargo ship that was taking on limited passengers. That's the Elizabeth. She was very happy because the captain, Seth Hasty, was a New Englander, and he was traveling with his wife on the boat, and she's gonna have the baby on the boat, and she felt very comfortable with all that. So they left Livorno, Italy for New York Harbor on May 23rd. Then, trouble happened from the start. This wonderful captain was dead by the time they got to Gibraltar of the smallpox. So they, they didn't get very far, right? And so there's a uh, burial at sea, uh, and Captain Hasty's first mate, his name was Henry Bangs, captain the ship. So let that be a, a message to you. If you're getting on board a ship and the name of the captain is Captain Bangs, <laughs> you may not want to take the journey. Okay, so anyway. So they made it fine across the Atlantic. But the problems began on the approach to New York Harbor. Oh, thank you so much. Because I'm trying to read this. And, okay, so let's look at the approach to New York Harbor. <laughs> okay, here's my thing. Oh, boy, what would I do without you? Thank you. Okay, here's the approach to New York Harbor again on a different type of map. Again, the ship's coming in this way, and here's the Fire Island Lighthouse, and here's New York Harbor. So the disaster happened as a combination of bad luck and bad judgment. So the bad luck happened because after two months at sea, they ran smack in the middle of a hurricane. Now remember, there's no warnings about this stuff. They just ran smack in the middle of a hurricane. There was no ship to shore communications. And this is a hurricane that I researched. They didn't call them hurricanes at the time, by the way. They called it a gale. And they didn't you know, rate them or anything. But this was a big gale because it started in Baltimore and was making its way all the way up to, and to, to, it hit New England. So it was making havoc all along the coast. Again, they had no notification. So bad luck, too bad, that's terrible. But then there was the bad judgment that was involved, and that had to do with Captain Bangs' inexperience, too. So he f sails into the storm, and he underestimates the force of the storm. He thought he could outrun it. In fact, he got the passengers on board the ship, and he said, oh, goody, there's a warm, Te heavy wind coming up from the south, it's gonna push us right up into New York Harbor. We'll get there even earlier than we expected. Go pack your trunks. That's right. So that was his bad judgment. And then, in addition to that, he misjudged the location because he saw the flashing light of a lighthouse, right? Oh goody, he said, we're right here and this is where we're gonna go. I'm gonna set a course due north. It's gonna push us right into New York Harbor. But instead, the light he was looking at was the Fire Island Lighthouse. So when he set his course due northward, it sent them right into the uh, Fire Island, uh, the, fire, the deserted Fire Island beaches. So 
Captain Bangs set a course for disaster, basically. So where exactly did the Elizabeth hit the shore? Here's a map of Fire Island. Here's the Fire Island light. Here's the wreck of the Elizabeth. Bang! And guess how far away the nearest life-saving hut was? Five miles, right? Because they're 10 miles apart. So this one came in in the exact worst spot you can possibly be in because all that equipment had to be hauled down the beach after they find volunteers on a deserted barrier island to carry all that stuff down to the beach, down to the wreck site. So by the time they got there, it was too late to do anything. The storm was in its height. Um, the Lyle gun couldn't get the hawser out to the boat. They couldn't get the lifeboat out after they dragged all that stuff down there. The, the tide was incredible, and they just couldn't even get it out. So to add to the bad luck of running into a hurricane and the bad judgment of this captain, there's the terrible judgment of this terrible life-saving service that was uh, available at the time. So, as you saw by the maps, this was not an unusual occurrence. There were a lot of shipwrecks, right? So a shipwreck, well, the newspaper would cover it like this. Page three, one-liner, because the underwriters needed it for insurance purposes. That's how frequent they were. But not this one. This wreck was covered for months and months and months. Front page coverage, and I followed the newspaper articles all the way across the country and on and on and on. Why? Well, because someone famous was on the boat, so if something happened to you and me, nobody would care, but if somebody's famous, right, just like now. And the condition of the life-saving service. It was the model for the utter failure of the life-saving service. So. People were really angry, and they were demanding changes to be made to that life-saving service. Find the money, they said, to man these stations. You can't have unmanned stations like this. So next, page, next one. So these are newspaper reports that were just going on and on and on about the tale of a wreck, the wreck. So there were months and months of news reports. And the criticism of the shore-based life-saving system put enough pressure on Congress to make improvements. Now, it didn't happen magically and overnight. It happened a little bit at a time. But eventually, they ended up with manned life-saving stations that had uniformed, trained professional staffs that were living there 24-7. So in maritime history, this is an important wreck because it helped to protect our shores because of this sad story of what happened to Margaret Fuller and the press that occurred because of Margaret Fuller and the baby and the whole story. So the bodies of Margaret Fuller and Giovanni Ossoli were never found. They found the baby's body and eventually buried it in the Fuller family graves in Mount Auburn Secretary, uh, Cemetery, Massachusetts. And a lot of investigating was going on. A lot of people came down to write the stories, to look for artifacts, etc. But one famous guy who came down was her very dear friend, Henry David Thoreau. He spent five days on Fire Island mm -hmm. investigating the wreck and looking for that manuscript of the Italian Revolution and any other writings that she might have had. <clears throat> so in Henry David Thoreau's writings, there's a letter to Emerson, because Emerson sent him down, and it's like a three-ish page letter describing what he found and uh, the conditions that were there. And that's very well known. It was always around, it was around for a very long time and everybody could find it very easily. But what happened when I was doing my research is that I went up to Harvard University and went to the Harvard Library because that's where the Fuller family papers are. There's boxes and boxes of them. And I was trying to find if there's anything else in the boxes that would give me any more information about the wreck. So um, the librarian was very nice. I was able to go through. I found letters that were written by Mrs. Hasty, who was the original captain's wife who survived the wreck. 
and Margaret's mother, it's so heartbreaking, they corresponded and they became friends, they visited, because Margaret's mother never got to meet her grandchild and Mrs. Hasty had two months on the boat with him. So she wanted to know about him and she wanted to know about her daughter and you know, so those letters were there and some other artifacts were there. But I didn't find out anything else about the wreck that day. So I went home and two weeks later, I get an email from this very nice librarian who says, you wanna to go to the next page? Who says to me, we just made an acquisition that I think would be of interest to you in your research. So what they acquired were all the notes that Thoreau made while he was on the beach for five days. So he was going around interviewing everybody who was there any of the survivors of the wreck, any of the sailors. Go to the next page. And so this is, this is look at that handwriting, it, 18 pages of notes. So it's like when you were in college, you had all these notes, but your paper was only 10 pages long. So he had 18 pages of notes during his five-day investigation, including these interviews, which provide eyewitness reports of what was said and done on the shore and on board the Elizabeth. So that's how I know Captain Bangs called the people up to and said, oh goody, pack your bags. And that's how I know about the errors that were made by Bangs uh, in his estimation because the sailors said so to Henry David Thoreau. How cool is that? I mean, research is, is so exciting, isn't it? Yeah. So that brings us to Shipwreck of Hopes, because I had all of this, and I really wanted to tell the story, and I didn't want to write a history, although everything in the book is historically correct. Every person in the book, I, you think of it as a character, because it's a fiction, but every person is actual. Uh, I researched the locals and who they were. I went to their graves. I was able to find out uh, the local story through the local newspapers and then all of this. And I, that's when I decided to do a historical fiction because even though all the facts are there and correct, you, I had to make up dialogue. Like who knows what sentences they actually said. And then I had to make up psychological uh, uh, motivations because you need to have that. But so therefore, this was my whole research journey to uh, making a shipwreck of hopes. And you guys have been so patient to listen to all this. I thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for picking up all my papers. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. Uh, if you have any questions. Hi. There were 23 on board. At, it was really a cargo ship, so it wasn't a lot of passengers. All the passengers died, right? And uh, uh, Mrs. Hasty wasn't considered a passenger. I guess she was considered crew. So that was Margaret, Giovanni, the baby, Celeste Paolini, who was uh, like a, a nurse for her, and uh, Horace Sumner, who was also from Massachusetts. So five. All five passengers died. So again, I mean, you could read disasters of shipwrecks along the South Shore and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of deaths, but this one was compelling to me for these other reasons. Can you tell us about the important piece of cargo that you discovered? Oh, oh, so um, one of the problems with the Elizabeth getting blown off course and getting stuck on the uh, sandbar is that it was carrying tons of Carrera marble. It was coming in from your, in Italy. So what's it carrying? Olive oil, you know, silks and braids and, and, and marble. And so there was a very famous American sculptor who was living in Florence, uh, Hiram Powers, and he was um, uh, asked to create a statue of, uh, what's his name? Calhoun, John C. Calhoun, thanks. My long-suffering husband has been listening to this for so long. John C. Calhoun for the state building that they were making down in South Carolina. So it was in the hold, and that was part of the reason why when the ship hit, the sandbar, it got wedged in there and it wasn't gonna move. It just sat there until the waves just pounded the ship to pieces. That's what happened to it. And um, 
So there's John C. Calhoun, this gigantic statue, in the, it was sitting in the sandbar. Now, on the south shore of Long Island and in New York City was a very wealthy southern family, uh, the Johnson family, who was Louisiana sugar plantation money. And I told you about New York City was really gathering steam. <clears throat> so he came up, he kept his sugar plantations, but all, he came to New York and made a whiskey distillery because all those people are going to want to have some whiskey, right? So he would bring up his sugar crops and he would use it to distill the whiskey. And this was um, on the west side of Manhattan. So his three sons all opened really big, beautiful estates on the south shore of Long Island because why not? There's plenty of money. And the south shore of Long Island was all duck hunting and fishing and beautiful place to be sailing. So there's John, John D. Johnson who lives not far on the south shore from where the wreck was and he wasn't going to leave John C. Calhoun under the water there because he's a southern guy. So he spearheaded the effort to uncover and rescue that statue and it took months. Um, actually he had to hire some specialists from uh, Boston who were working on dive apparatus that was brand new at the time. Every time they tried to uh, uncover the coffin, the wooden box that the statue was in, it got blown back again. It took until November to get that statue up. And then he ended up bringing it down to Carolina and installing it in the State House. And there it stood proudly until it was destroyed during the Civil War. <laughs> So this was a lost cause from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Asali what? Where? Yeah, but do you know where? Wow. Ossley. Margaret Fuller Ossley. It has to be. Yeah. How interesting. I never heard that. Uh, yeah. Let me put that on the list. Mm -hmm. huh? Oh, wow. Well, thank you for that. I never heard of that before. Yes. Yes. But that was the Ossoli name. They were nobles, very old in Italy. So, yes. The name goes very far back. It's in the, in the Golden Book of Royals or something in Italy. It was very, yeah. Yeah. Probably Margaret Fuller Ossley. Absolutely, yeah. Wow, thank you for that. I have to look that up. Very interesting. You always learn. To, see, there's always something new that comes up. Yeah. Yes. Oh. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it was an act of courage. You don't, <laughs> you may not come back, exactly. That was their motto. 
Right. Mm -hmm. So they, this, the, they, the, uh, the government, the Treasury set up two ser services. One was the shore-based service, and another one was the, uh, the clipper service the cutter service. So the cutter service, cutters were fast boats, and if you're coming into New York Harbor, they would stop your boat and board it to make sure you were paying your import taxes. And so that was one arm, and then the other arm was the life-saving service, which you don't understand for it. So it wasn't until like 1915 when they merged the two services together to form the Coast Guard. But this was a one arm of the early uh, rendition of the Coast Guard. Thanks for bringing all that up, and thanks for the plug, because the lighthouse has three buildings. There's three separate buildings on it, chock-filled with all kinds of interesting artifacts and history. The lighthouse that we have now is 17 stories tall, and we say, I say now, it was built in 1858. It just wasn't the one that you saw from 1826 in the picture. I just want to make that clear. 17 stories, you can climb the top, and there's a 360 degree go around once you get on top, and the view is unbelievable, the shipping lanes and all that, so. Um, you can actually see the terminal Absolutely, uh, yeah, you can. That period of reform for the life saving service was also when they started to reform the lighthouse service, and started building all these new lighthouses, and they got their hands, they finally appropriated money for those train out lenses. The Fresnel lens, right. And we have, yeah. The one before that was like a hurricane lamp with like a shiny mirror kind of thing in the back. But that was what they had. And then the Fresnel lens that we have is a first order Fresnel lens made in Paris, France, 16 feet tall, weighs over 4,000 pounds, has over 300 prisms in it. It's gigantic and gorgeous. It's like a big piece of jewelry. But that was run on whale oil wicks, and it was able to take the light from whale oil wicks and send the light 20 miles out to sea. And it's incredible. I mean, and so very important in uh, maritime safety. So. 2011. Right, yes. Yeah, because no, we weren't going to take it apart and carry it 17 stories up and start using whale oil again, so we made a separate building for it, because right now you just flip an electric switch and that's where we get our light from. <laughs> yes, thank you for all that. No, I don't know that name. Here's a mirror image of this story from Frankfurt Duke of Bremen. So we have in the same period of time who, like Margaret, going to Europe to investigate. Frederica is Swedish and is well read around the world. She wrote her novels, her short stories are translated in the 1840s. And she comes to America to find out Ah. And so she is quite a feminist, and she travels the country and goes everywhere wow. on her own. Um, and I can't believe that she didn't know of Margaret Fuller or perhaps have conversation with her or correspondence. So what year did she come here? She was here in 1859, 49 and 50. So 49 she, Fuller was in Europe, right. and she was dead by 50. So they might have. Yeah. Oh, that's a hot place. Oh. Mm-hmm. I have to look this her up. That's very interesting. That's Fuller, right? Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness, this is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm.
Oh, man. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh huh. Fabulous. I never knew that. I never, I mean, in reading her letters and everything, I don't remember seeing any correspondence to her, but I'm going to look again. Yeah. Wow. Fabulous. What a lot. How long did she live? Uh, she lived to be an older lady. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. Fola was dead by the time she was 40. So, and that's what I could just imagine the effect she would have had if she had lived longer. <clears throat> well, thank you for all that information. Any other questions? Oh, okay. Well, thank you again so much. Oh. No. No, no. No, I was I think I was trying to say that the captain's wife knew Margaret's baby because she spent two months with her. Well, at the beginning when you said Margaret felt comfortable because the captain was very experienced and his wife was going to have a baby. Oh, I don't I didn't mean to say that. Did I say that? <laughs> Oh, no, I, I think what I tried to say was that she was comfortable with them as a couple and the, and the captain's wife because her baby, Angelina, was going to be on board the ship for two months. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't mean to misstate that. Okay. Thank you. So I find it fascinating that the audience probably came here tonight with so many different thoughts and interests, like your interest in the lighthouses or in feminism. So I, you know, like the, the topic of Margaret Fuller is so multifaceted and so is the audience. Um, I also want to quote one of the local Newburgh historians who did a wonderful presentation at the Newburgh Historical last week on their Cocktails and Collections pro project, where he talks about not um, going down the rabbit hole of research, but literally falling into a deep hole in the middle of the earth when he does the research. And I think that's exactly what you did. You fell into a very deep hole. It's, just, it's a rabbit hole. You just keep going and going. You're discovering new and new things. And you just have to follow each lead. And yeah. 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 So awesome. I'd like to present you a little certificate for your participation. <laughs> and as a writer, uh, one of our pens. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming this evening. Have a good night.